All right, hi everyone. This is lecture 14, Endocrine System Part 2. So we are going to continue with the endocrine system where we have already talked about the basics of hormone signaling. So also how we control the release and the response to hormones. We have also introduced a bit about the hypothalamus and pituitary interaction that helps to regulate hormones in the glands that we're going to talk about today. But let's just review a little bit in case it's been a while since you looked over lecture number 13. So a hormone is a chemical released into the blood to regulate distant target cells. Endocrinology is the study of hormones and the endocrine organs that produce and release them. The major processes that the endocrine system can regulate are really homeostatic processes, reproduction, growth and development, um, electrolyte, water, nutrient balance of the blood, cellular metabolism and energy balance, and immune defenses. This is a review of the anatomy to give you guys a slide to go back to in case you forget where each of these glands is located. So let's return then to where we left off in part one, which is the chain of command between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the downstream endocrine glands. So I want to draw this out, even though you do have some diagrams in your book, I wanna take a moment to draw this slowly so that we know um, kind of we're all on the same page about this. Okay, so we talked about the hypothalamus. As the manager. So the hypothalamus is a neuro, meaning that it's in the brain. Endocrine, meaning that it has hormonal influence. Organ. It's really a part of the brain, but we're going to call it an organ. The hypothalamus is going to send hormones to the anterior pituitary. Those hormones are releasing or inhibiting hormones. So you will see RH and IH in a lot of the names of the hypothalamic hormones. Those hormones are going to cause the release or stop the release of hormones from the anterior pituitary. So this is an example of hormone stimulus to the anterior pituitary. So the hypothalamus stimulates through releasing or inhibiting hormones the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary, then, is the assistant manager. The assistant manager ultimately is still under control of the manager, but the assistant manager is also going to send signals to the workers. And the workers are the downstream endocrine glands. So thyroid, for example, um, other endocrine glands, okay? The anterior pituitary is going to send out hormones that will stimulate the downstream endocrine glands. Those hormones not only stimulate, but they also affect the growth and the production of hormones in those other endocrine glands. So this is a second example of hormone stimulus, and they come from the anterior pituitary to the endocrine glands. So they're not simply stimulating release or inhibiting release. They can actually stimulate growth and production within the endocrine glands. That's different than growth of the whole body. We're talking about the size of the endocrine gland and how much hormone that endocrine gland is producing. Then these endocrine glands is what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to go one by one and talk about the major hormones that those endocrine glands are producing. 
they're going to send their hormones into the blood to have the final effect on target cells. The target cells then is where you will actually get the change in homeostasis or the particular homeostatic factors that we're talking about. So we have one hormone from the hypothalamus which goes through the blood, the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary and stimulates the anterior pituitary. It can also inhibit if it's an inhibiting hormone. Then the anterior pituitary will release a hormone if it's been stimulated into the bloodstream to the whole body and that, that whole body then, that hormone that goes through the bloodstream in the whole body is going to go to a target endocrine gland or sometimes multiple endocrine glands and increase the growth, production, and secretion of that endocrine gland downstream. That endocrine then, gland then is going to be the primary producer of the final hormone which will go into general circulation to get to the target cells. And the effects on the target cells will be the final change in homeostasis. So again, if you guys haven't printed out the chart yet, I have linked a chart for you guys to help organize the endocrine system. And one just small warning about the endocrine system. My students tell me that this is one of their most difficult systems to study. And I think it's because there are so many names that are similar and because there are so many molecules within a particular pathway. So we're going to center everything on the main gland. For example, we're gonna talk about the thyroid gland or the parathyroid gland. And then we'll talk about regulation of the hypothalamus pituitary level for that gland. And then we'll talk about the targets for the hormones of that gland. Through that, we will go through several major processes today. We're going to go through growth regulation through the action of growth hormone. We're going to go through metabolism regulation through the action of the thyroid. We're going to go through calcium regulation through the action of the parathyroid, stress regulation through the action of cortisol, sleep-wake cycle regulation through the action of melatonin, blood glucose regulation through the action of insulin. Other hormones that will come up later when we talk about urinary and reproductive systems, we will introduce you to and tell you where they come from, but the actions of those hormones we're going to deal with when we actually talk about those individual systems. So aldosterone, estrogen, testosterone, those we're going to get to later on in this unit. Excuse me, the next unit. Okay, so first, growth. So when we talk about growth of the whole body, we're talking about growth spurts. So in children and in teenagers or adolescents, um, these growth spurts or long periods of um, fast growth require the synthesis of a lot of proteins. It also requires the lengthening of bones and increasing the size and number of cells in the body. Growth in general, growth of the whole body during these growth spurts is regulated by growth hormone. But other hormones can influence growth. Thyroid hormone can influence growth. Insulin can in influence growth. Sex hormones, androgens and estrogens can influence growth. Growth is also influenced by genetics. The basic genetics of when the hormones and how the hormones are regulated, it can be influenced by diet because metabolism is very closely linked to the growth of cells and the ability of protein synthesis, and the level of stress and chronic disease. So these are the times in life when we have major growth spurts. We have a postnatal, postnatal growth spurt right after birth between the age uh, from birth to about approximately two to four years. And then things level off between four and 10 to 12. This obviously will be different in individuals. And then we get another peak in growth, which is the puberty-related growth spurt 
around the age of 12 to 18, and then things will level off again. So growth hormone is a hormone that increases growth and metabolism. It is a water-soluble or amino acid-based hormone. It is produced and released in the anterior pituitary. Its functions are metabolic. It's going to increase fat breakdown and increase blood glucose. That fat breakdown and blood glucose then supports the growth of cells. So the growth functions are increase in protein synthesis, that is increase in muscle mass, increase in general cellular proteins for cellular growth. It also increases bone growth, so it increases the activity of cells and the production of cells in the bones. And it increases overall cell division. So the regulation of growth hormone is hormonal from the hypothalamus. So there is growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone coming from the hypothalamus, which will either cause release, stimulating in the anterior pituitary, or inhibit release, the inhibiting growth hormone inhibiting hormone from the anterior pituitary. There is also negative feedback of some downstream molecules, IGF-1, and growth hormone itself. The, the second way to regulate growth hormone is neural. That is one of the reasons that teenagers sleep so much. So diurnal rhythms or sleep-wake cycles affect the levels of growth hormone. Namely, growth hormone is increased during sleep. So growth hormone actions to promote growth are actually mediated by these molecules called IGFs. They're called insulin-like growth factors because of their similarity in structure to insulin. They're also called somatomedins. Same, same. IGFs are somatomedins. IGFs are peptide hormones. They are also water-soluble. IGF-1 is released into the blood by the liver, and it causes um, soft tissue cell number and cell size increases, long bone growth, and it will feed back on the anterior pituitary to slow down growth hormone release. There's also an IGF-2 that has been um, measured in fetal development, but we don't know its role in adults. So let's take a second to then draw out the growth hormone pathway. Okay, so I'm going to use this basic template of what we drew out in the part one lecture, where we have an endocrine gland that's releasing a hormone into the bloodstream, and then from the bloodstream, that hormone will travel to reach its targets. And we're going to fill in the basis of this pathway. So the endocrine gland that we are talking about right now is anterior pituitary. And the hormone is going to be growth hormone. Growth hormone is stimulated by, whoops, go down a little bit, by GH. RH or growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. What type of stimulus is that? We have three possibilities, neural, blood, hormonal. Hormonal, so it's a hormonal stimulus. That stimulates the release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. It's going to travel into the bloodstream. It is water soluble, so it's going to be dissolved in the plasma, travel through the bloodstream, and here are its targets. The targets for growth hormone are the liver, and in general, all body cells. We'll add a third target. which is adipose or fat tissue. 
So all of these targets are going to have receptors for growth hormone. And let's talk now about what happens when growth hormone reaches these targets. So when growth hormone reaches the liver, it's going to cause the liver to produce IGFs. IGFs then will stimulate growth downstream in general soft tissue and in general um, body cells and stimulate bone growth. In general all body cells, growth hormone will also generally increase growth and metabolism. So it's going to increase growth, increase metabolism in all body cells. Increasing metabolism increases amino acid uptake. It's going to increase protein synthesis. It's going to decrease blood glucose uptake. And it's going to increase fatty acid uptake. So if we measured the blood, we would have an increase in blood sugar as a result of growth hormone we would have a decrease in amino acids and a decrease in fatty acids. The increase in blood sugar supports the brain. The increase, excuse me, the decrease in amino acids is because we're supporting metabolism and protein synthesis. The breakdown of fat tissue is then to get more fatty acids to the body. And then those fatty acids will be taken up for the process of metabolism, for the increase in metabolism and downstream use. The regulation is going to be a negative feedback regulation through IGFs. IGFs are going to go back through the bloodstream and inhibit growth hormone release from the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone itself will also feed back negatively and reduce its own release from the anterior pituitary. We also have regulation from the hypothalamus through growth, growth hormone inhibiting hormones. So these are the checks and balances to make sure that as growth hormone is being stimulated and released, that the levels don't get too high because we have negative feedback coming from IGFs, coming from growth hormone, and then we have a negative um, inhibiting hormone coming from the hypothalamus, all to keep growth hormone from getting too high. So that's growth hormone. Your book and um, other textbooks have uh, similar diagrams, um, which you may come back to for reference. Um, what's really cool about the endocrine system is that we can also talk about different syndromes. I'm going to do this for each one of the growth, uh, excuse me, not, not growth, each one of the endocrine hormones. So if we have too much growth hormone, then that can lead to, look at this picture, gigantism, where the whole body gets extremely large, and that's if you have too much growth hormone before um, the closure of the growth plates. If you have growth hormone after, you can also get um, acromegaly, which is enlargement of extremities. Um, too little growth hormone is, in this case, one of the causes of dwarfism. If it is found that um, growth hormone is deficient in a patient before epiphyseal plate closure, before bone growth has um, been completed, then growth hormone replacement therapy is um, helpful um, in treating conditions like dwarfism. Growth hormone is also abused by bodybuilders, athletes, um, and even some physicians will prescribe it um, or suggest it for the elderly. Um, but there is minimal evidence that it actually will help with muscle strength um, or stature increase in adults. So 
So once the growth plates are closed, um, once that um, sort of critical period for um, growth has ended, growth hormone doesn't have much of an effect on bones and muscles. The side effects then of abuse can be fluid retention, joint and muscle pain, diabetes, and also because you're increasing mitosis with growth hormone, one of the major problems with abusive growth hormone is an increase in cancer. Okay, next is thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone um, comes from the thyroid. The thyroid is a gland here in the neck. Um, and they're also called T3 and T4. So thyroid hormone T3 and T4 are the major metabolic hormones of the body. They are lipid soluble and plasma protein bound. T4 has four iodines and it is called tetraiodothyronine. It is stored, it is the stored and secreted form. T3 is triiodothyronine. So one of its iodines has been removed. I'm going to show you the pathway in a bit. And it is the more potent, more biologically active form. Both T3 and T4 are produced and released by the thyroid gland, although this production and release is a bit more complicated, which I'm going to show you. Their functions are to increase metabolic rate, increase heat production, which is a secondary effect of increasing metabolism, they can increase growth and central nervous system development, and they can also increase sympathetic nervous system activity. So the regulation of thyroid hormone is both hormonal and neural. The hormonal regulation comes from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. It is also regulated by negative feedback. The neural regulation comes from some reports of body temperature, some research on body temperature, particularly in infants, and also stress. So let's draw out the thyroid hormone pathway. So the endocrine gland that we're in now is the thyroid. And the hormone is going to be T3 and T4. The stimulus for thyroid hormone release is TSH from the anterior pituitary. What kind of a stimulus is that? Hormonal. The TSH is stimulated by the hypothalamus through a hormone called TRH, which is a releasing hormone. So the hypothalamus releases TRH, that causes the anterior pituitary to release TSH, that stimulates the thyroid to produce T3 and T4. T3 and T4 are going to circulate in the blood. There are some differences, which I'll show you in a bit. They're going to circulate in the blood, and their targets are going to be all body cells. So all body cells have receptors for T3 and T4. They will also target the blood vessels. So blood vessels have receptors for T3 and T4. And what happens when they reach their targets? For all body cells, T3 and T4 will increase metabolism. They're going to increase growth and development, and they will increase heat production. When they affect the blood vessels, we're going to get an increase in sympathetic nervous system receptors to increase blood pressure. The regulation then is through negative feedback. So the levels of T3 and T4 can go back to the anterior pituitary and inhibit the TSH from the anterior pituitary, 
the levels of T3 and T4 can also go back to the hypothalamus and inhibit the TRH from the hypothalamus. There are other hormones that can affect thyroid hormone. Um, in particular, um, GHIH will inhibit thyroid hormone, dopamine, and glucocorticoids. Because metabolism affects so many other body processes, we have multiple things that can affect metabolism. So those are the major hormonal regulations, including the negative feedback pathways. We also have neural stimulation. And this is a weird one, but they have found that cold temperature and stress can increase thyroid hormone. We did this experiment when we studied our mice in cold temperatures, and we saw that they increased their metabolism to increase body heat. The main research in humans, though, um, has seen this effect in infants, not really in adults. Okay, so that is the thyroid hormone pathway. Um, your book and other books have similar um, diagrams. So TRH comes from the hypothalamus, that's the releasing hormone causes the anterior pituitary to release TSH. TSH then stimulates the thyroid gland to release T3 and T4 to go to the target cells. Thyroid hormone synthesis is complicated, but it is something that we want to understand because um, thyroid hormone is such a common condition. Uh, thyroid hormone um, deficiency and excess thyroid hormone um, are such common conditions that you guys will see in your clinical careers. So this is basically the way that it works. It's made from the amino acid tyrosine and iodide. So we have something called thyroglobulin, which will um, have tyrosines attached. And this will be synthesized in follicular cells. The iodide then, through active transport mechanisms, is going to be transported into these follicular cells within the thyroid. Iodide will be converted to iodine and attached to the tyrosine in those cells. Then T3 and T4 will be made inside the storage compartment of the thyroid, which is called the colloid. So inside the colloid, T3 and T4 um, are going to be made by attaching to thyroglobulins. T3 and T4 thyroglobulins then will be sent back into the follicular cells and um, stored until T3 and T4 are initiated for release. Excuse me, they're going to be stored in the colloid until they're ready to be released and then they will be sent back into the follicular cells where T3 and T4 will be separated from those thyroglobulins. Thyroglobulin just means a large protein. From those large proteins, and then T3 and T4 will be sent into the blood. So there are some other diagrams which help to understand um, how T3 and T4 are synthesized, and I like this one from a different textbook. So we have iodine, iodide from the blood, is going to come into the colloid cells. Iodide will be actively transported in because the colloid cells need it to produce T3 and T4. Then the iodine will be attached to the tyrosines. If it's attached to two, if, if two iodides are attached, then it's diiodo. If it's a single iodine, then it's mono iodo, and then you will have different combinations of di and mono to get T3 and T4. T4 has four iodines, T3 has three iodines, and then purple here are the tyrosines. So we have tyrosines attached to iodines, and that gives us thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone will then be transported into, back into the follicular cells to be released into the bloodstream. T3 and T4 will both be released into the bloodstream. 
T3 and T4 have some differences. So T4 is the major form of thyroid hormone that is stored and secreted by the thyroid. The majority of T3 is made once T4 gets to the liver and the kidneys. So only about 20% of the total T3 that's circulating in the bloodstream was directly secreted by the thyroid gland. The majority of T3 was converted by the liver and the kidneys. T3, though, is the most potent, most active form of thyroid hormone. So T3 is 10 times more potent than thyroid hormone, uh, than T4. <laughs> Thyroid hormone. T3 is 10 times more potent than T4, so it is the more important of the two. So thyroid hormone has some fascinating syndromes. As an aside, I got a virus a few years ago um, that caused me to be hyperthyroid for about three months, and it was the most uncomfortable I have ever been in my life. So um, my heart was pumping, I was sweating, I would wake up in the morning and just, you know, just literally brushing my hair in front of the mirror, I would get dizzy just standing up, um, and I just felt like my, my, uh, my whole body was just warm. I also lost a lot of weight in just a couple of months. So hyperthyroid is really uncomfortable, um, and it is caused by excess T3 and T4, it's also caused by various autoimmune diseases or tumors. Um, in adults, hyperthyroid causes high metabolism, sweating, um, increased heartbeat, irregular heartbeat, anxiety, and um, sort of um, characteristic protruding and bulging eyes. And Graves' disease is one of the autoimmune disorders that causes hyperthyroidism. Hype O or low thyroid is low T3 and T4. Um, sometimes it's because you don't have enough iodine in your diet. Um, it can also be because of hypothalamus or anterior pituitary hormone deficiency. Um, it can also um, be for, um, for other um, related reasons. So thyroid gland disease is going to be more on the cold side. So hyperthyroid is hot and anxious. Hypothyroid is cold and sluggish. Low metabolism, they feel cold, they have dry, dry skin, they have puffy eyes, they have edema, swelling. Um, it can um, cause mental disability if it happens early in life. Um, it can also cause something called a goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid gland due to iodine deficiency. So you're getting continued signals from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to produce thyroid hormone, but um, the full thyroid hormone can't be released because you don't have enough iodine to produce it. So you end up getting these huge nodules in the thyroid gland. Okay, that was thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. Now let's do calcitonin. So calcitonin is also produced and released by the thyroid gland. It's produced in a different population of cells. So these are called parafollicular cells. So we did the follicle and the colloid cells. Parafollicular cells are sort of in between those cells. So this is a different population of cells. Um, and this has a totally different function. So calcitonin um, is actually um, uh, sent out to reduce blood calcium. So it inhibits bone breakdown and it stimulates calcium storage in bones. It's going to overall reduce blood calcium as its function, and it is regulated by blood calcium levels. So what kind of regulation is that? Yeah, don't cheat. Yep, it's a blood or humoral regulation. So when blood calcium levels are too high, then parathyroid hormone, excuse me, when blood calcium levels are too high, then calcitonin will be released to reduce blood calcium back down. Uh, one side note is that a lot of this research has been done in animal models. Um, as, as of right now, calcitonin does not seem to have a huge role in humans. If the thyroid is removed because of hypo, excuse me, hyperthyroid or um, other tumor-related conditions, there can be little to no effect on the patient calcium homeostasis. So parathyroid hormone is the more important calcium regulation, and it is the opposite of calcitonin. This one is extremely important 
and removal of parathyroid glands and loss of parathyroid hormone can be fatal to a patient. So calcitonin lowering blood calcium, not so important. Parathyroid hormone increasing blood calcium, extremely important. Parathyroid hormone is an amino acid based or water soluble hormone. It's produced and released by the thyroid gland. These are tiny glands on the back of the thyroid. They were discovered because <clears throat> of the common practice of removing the thyroid gland in patients. And occasionally, you would have a patient get extremely ill and even die from removal of the thyroid gland. It wasn't until they found these parathyroid glands that they figured out why. So now when they do thyroid gland surgery, they have to make sure to leave the parathyroid glands intact. Otherwise, you're risking the life of your patient. And they are three to four tiny glands on the back of the thyroid. They increase blood calcium. Um, to do that, they also have to decrease blood phosphates, otherwise the calcium phosphate um, will bind together. Um, and they also stimulate vitamin D, which is part of the calcium homeostasis pathway. The regulation, um, just like for calcitonin, is going to be blood levels of calcium, um, and calcium levels in the blood will be a blood or humoral stimulus for regulation. Again, these are absolutely required for calcium homeostasis and removal can be fatal. So think of all the places in your body where we require calcium, particularly um, for the pumping of the heart. So there's another picture of the parathyroid glands. And let's do the parathyroid hormone Okay, so our gland now is parathyroid gland. Well, there's three or four of them, right? So parathyroid glands. Our hormone is going to be parathyroid hormone, which is going to enter the bloodstream. The target of parathyroid hormone is going to be primarily the bones, and the kidneys. So the bones have receptors for parathyroid hormone and the kidneys have receptors for parathyroid hormone. When parathyroid hormone reaches bone cells, it's going to increase calcium release from extracellular fluid in the bones by adding calcium pumps. It can also increase bone breakdown through the activity of osteoclasts. So we're going to increase calcium release through the bones. And you can do that through extracellular fluid stored in the bones or by increasing osteoclast, clast or bone breakdown cells activity. They will also Parathyroid hormone will also target the kidneys. It can do two things in the kidneys. It can increase calcium retention, so prevent calcium release from the kidneys into the urine, so prevent elimination of calcium, and it can also increase vitamin D activation. So the kidneys, if you go back to your skin lecture, are related to activation of vitamin D, and that ultimately increases calcium absorption through the small intestine. So vitamin D indirectly increases calcium absorption. So this is all about getting increased in calcium in the blood. That's the ultimate goal of parathyroid hormone. And it is stimulated by a decrease in blood calcium. That stimulus is a humoral or a blood stimulus. 
so if blood calcium is too low, it stimulates the parathyroid glands to release parathyroid hormone. That will increase calcium release from the bones, increase calcium retention in the kidneys, increase vitamin D activation and absorption of calcium from the diet, and bring calcium levels back up. Those increased calcium levels in the blood then will go back and inhibit, oops, excuse me, we should go all the way up to the gland, inhibit parathyroid release. Okay. So you have a similar diagram in your textbook, which shows the bone and the kidney role um, in calcium homeostasis as directed by parathyroid hormone. So hyperparathyroidism or too much parathyroid can be caused by tumors. Um, that can cause an increase in bone, la bone loss through, much, through too much osteoclast activity. It can cause nervous system depression, muscle weakness, weak reflexes, and calcium deposits in the kidneys, which can cause kidney stones. It can be a secondary response to low blood calcium due to kidney failure. Hypoparathyroidism, or too low, um, can cause muscle spasms, it can cause nervous, si nervous system hyperexcitability, convulsions, paralysis, and in the extreme case, even be deadly. Okay, that was parathyroid hormone, so let's go to the um, adrenal glands now. So the adrenal glands are small glands which sit above the kidneys, and they have an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The adrenal medulla secretes a class of hormones called catecholamines. These hormones we already talked about when we talked about the autonomic nervous system. These hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, enhance the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. That is, they, they help with stress regulation and blood pressure reg regulation as dictated by the sympathetic nervous system. So the adrenal medulla is stimulated by direct neural activation through the sympathetic nervous system. If you don't remember this, go back to our um, efferent nervous system lecture where we talk about the adrenal medulla. The adrenal cortex then is what we're going to focus on more for the endocrine system. So the adrenal cortex is the outer region of the adrenal glands and it's almost like a whole separate organ. It's very different from the adrenal medulla, both in cell type and function. There are three types of hormones produced by the adrenal cortex. There are mineral corticoids. So the cortico here refers to cortex. Um, and they are all steroid-based or lipid-soluble hormones that are made from cholesterol. There are glucocorticoids. For example, cortisol is the one we're primarily going to talk about. There are also sex hormones or androgens. You may remember this from anatomy, where the different zones of the adrenal cortex produce different sets of these um, steroid hormones, aldosterone in the outer zone, cortisol and androgens in um, the, the middle, larger region, and then epinephrine and norepinephrine um, in the medulla. So first, mineral corticoids are primarily aldosterone. Aldosterone is really important for fluid balance, and it helps to increase sodium in the blood as retained from the urine. It also helps to decrease potassium in the blood, which will be eliminated in the urine. Its very important role in water balance is going to be discussed when we talk about the renin-angiotensin system um, in the urinary system lecture. Enough for me right now is that you know that aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex and that it increases sodium and decreases potassium in the blood. Its deficiency is fatal because of the potential loss of blood volume. So the gonadocorticoids are sex hormones. The sex hormones are generally classed as androgens and they are also produced in the adrenal cortex but they're not primarily produced in the adrenal cortex. The primary production of sex hormones is the gonads, so the testes or the ovaries. But they are also produced by the adrenal cortex, and the production from the adrenal cortex is um, 
thought to be, not thought to be, it is related to secondary sex characteristics which develop during puberty. So estrogen and testosterone are mainly going to come from the ovaries and the testes. And then there's another hormone called DHEA. This is the hormone that's primarily produced in the adrenal cortex. It's a very weak precursor to testosterone, and it's mainly involved in secondary sex characteristics during puberty. It is a masculinizing effect if it is seen in excess. So it can cause, cause growth spurts, it can cause male hair patterns, and it can increase sex drive. The main one we're going to talk about in terms of the adrenal cortex is cortisol. So cortisol has a role in metabolism. It increases blood glucose in order to sequester blood glucose for the brain. It increases protein breakdown and it increases fat breakdown. All of its role in metabolism is because um, it is related to the stress response. So um, it is released during times of stress and it can, during times of stress, also suppress the immune system. So it can block inflammation pathways and it can block antibody production. So cortisol-related medications are actually used in patients to suppress the immune system. So prednisone is a very common medication um, prescribed to patients who have overactive immune systems or in patients where we want to prevent um, big immune responses. So here's cortisol. It is maintaining blood glucose and enhancing the stress response. It is steroid-based or lipid-soluble, produced and released by the adrenal cortex. Its function is to increase gluconeogenesis, increase the breakdown of fats, increase the breakdown of proteins. It has anti-inflammatory and anti-immune effects. Its regulation is hormonal. It is regulated by the hypothalamus through corticotropin-releasing hormone and by the anterior pituitary through adrenocorticotropin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. It is also neurally regulated and increased during stress. So let's do the cortisol pathway. Okay, so now we are in the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal cortex makes several hormones, but the one we're talking about right now is cortisol. So cortisol will be released into the blood to affect target cells. It's primarily going to affect the liver and the immune system. Its effect on the liver is to increase gluconeogenesis, which is to make glucose from fatty acids and amino acids. It will also have effects on adipose tissue and general body cells by increasing fat breakdown and increasing protein breakdown. That is in order to support the gluconeogenesis in the liver. So it is released from the adrenal cortex and it is regulated by the anterior pituitary hormone A, C, T, H, adrenocorticotropic hormone. The anterior pituitary then is regulated by the hypothalamus. And the hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary in this pathway is CRH, or corticotropin releasing hormone. So hypothalamus releases CRH. That stimulates the anterior pituitary to release ACTH. That stimulates the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. This is hormonal stimulus. We can also have 
neural stimulus. Through the sympathetic nervous system. And it is also found through sleep-wake cycles to change because we have the highest cortisol in the morning and the lowest cortisol at night. So that is neurally regulated, the adrenal cortex. You will see diagrams of the cortisol pathway in your textbook, which are very similar. So CRH increases the anterior pituitary release of ACTH, increases the adrenal cortex release of cortisol, and ultimately that's going to stimulate gluconeogenesis and increase blood glucose. That will also um, cause the breakdown of proteins and the breakdown of fats to get those amino acids and fatty acids to the liver for the um, gluconeogenesis increase. So far, we have seen several hormones that affect blood glucose. So when you guys are done with this lecture, I want you to go back and summarize all the hormones that can affect blood glucose. And we're going to be doing a lab on that this week. So some syndromes that are related to cortisol. Low secretion or hyposecretion of cortisol um, is usually also both mineral and glucocorticoids. There's one disease called Addison's disease which has low cortisol. Um, this can lead to weight loss, low blood sugar, low blood ions because of the aldosterone effects, dehydration, and low blood pressure, again, because of the aldosterone effects. Excess glucocorticoids can be caused by many things. Um, anterior pituitary hormones, um, uh, treatment for immune diseases through prednisone, um, Excess of glucocorticoids, the excess of glucocorticoids like cortisol can actually mimic diabetes. Again, the increase in gluconeogenesis that is caused by cortisol increases blood sugar, and persistent elevation in blood sugar can look like diabetes. It can also cause muscle and bone loss, water and salt retention, from that water and salt retention swelling or edema, and high blood pressure. There is a characteristic moon face, especially in children who have been treated with high levels of cortisol-related drugs. Um, Cushing syndrome is one syndrome that is caused by excess cortisol and it can have this moon face characteristic as well as increase abdominal um, back and neck fat. It can, be, it can cause chronic infections because of the suppression of the immune system and muscle and bone weakening. This picture I just find so sad. So here's a little boy prior to Cushing's disease, and then here he is just four months later after Cushing's disease. And what I find really um, sort of sad and interesting about these conditions is some of the research that is relating chronic stress and chronic release of cortisol, especially in low socioeconomic communities, with the persistence of diabetes in those low socioeconomic communities. So there are many times where we judge patients for having diabetes. Um, it's because of poor diet or um, poor eating habits that they have driven themselves into diabetes. Well, it can also be caused by chronic stress. Um, in particular, um, we should look out for patients who look like they have diabetes, but they actually have Cushing syndrome. So the stress response overall is the body's response to extreme threats to homeostasis. These can be physical stresses like trauma, surgery, extreme temperatures, chemical stresses, um, oxygen deprivation, acid-base imbalances, physiological stresses, extremely heavy exercise, um, hemorrhagic shock, pain, um, infections, pathogen invasion. They can also be psychological and social anxiety, personal changes. So the neural and hormonal responses um, will be altered um, 
similarly in psychological and social stress as they will be for physical and physiological stress because the body doesn't really know the difference between physical, chemical, physiological stress and psychological stress. Stress is stress to the body and the body will mobilize biochemical resources in order to deal with these stresses. So the neural response to stress is sympathetic nervous system activation. The endocrine response to stress is to support the brain and provide building blocks for tissue repair. This would be normal if it was a physical or physiological stress, right? You had some kind of injury or infection. So we need to provide extra blood sugar, break down fat, break down protein in order to provide and support, support the brain in this stress response. It will also increase blood volume and blood pressure to get more blood to the muscles, to the heart, and to the brain. It will enhance learning and memory circuits, which sometimes can be good, right? We need to remember that thing that was stressful, but sometimes can be not so good in the case of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, where you have a stressful event and the enhancement of learning and memory circuits becomes a chronic condition. So the stress re response involves epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, cortisol from the adrenal cortex, ACTH, which is related to cortisol, vasopressin from the posterior pituitary, angiotensin from the kidneys, those are both related to blood volume and blood pressure regulation, insulin from the pancreas, and glucagon from the pancreas. So short-term stress is going to be increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased blood sugar, increased metabolism, and then inhibiting those functions that we don't need, digestion and urinary output. That will happen through the sympathetic nervous system. Long-term or chronic stress is going to happen through the release of aldosterone and cortisol from the adrenal cortex. This is where you will get long-term changes and increases in blood pressure, long-term suppression of the immune system, and long-term protein and fat breakdown with the increase in blood sugar as the goal. So some diagrams from a different textbook, but I like the visual here because it shows you the neural regulation of the adrenal medulla and epinephrine norepinephrine, and then the hormonal regulation of the adrenal cortex through aldosterone and cortisol. Okay, switching gears, let's talk about melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone that induces sleep. Um, it is produced and released by the pineal gland, which is a tiny gland in the back lower region of the brain. Um, it inhibits, um, it, well, its other proposed functions um, are, are not as well known, um, but we are sort of in the process of, of increasing research on melatonin. Um, it seems that it may have an effect on reproduction. It may have an effect on seasonal changes in behavior. Um, it may be, um, some people have proposed it has antioxidant and anti-aging effects and that it may increase immune function. It's regulated neurally by direct light and dark input into the brain from the retina. The retina produces a protein called mel melanopsin and those melanopsin cells will then signal to the hypothalamus to increase melatonin in the pineal gland. I don't think we need to draw out the melatonin pathway. It's very simple, but I think you guys can use the same logic that we've been using to do this as well. Okay. Now we're gonna to go to insulin. So insulin and glucagon will be, um, I believe, the last two hormones we're going to talk about. So insulin is very clinically important because of um, the high incidence of diabetes. So insulin, <coughs> excuse me, lowers blood glucose by allowing cells to transport glucose in. It is an amino acid-based hormone that is produced and released by the pancreas. Its function is to allow cells to use glucose. What do cells use glucose for? They use glucose for um, cellular respiration. So they're going to general cells in the body, fat cells, 
um, other cells will uptake glucose, muscle cells will take glucose in so they can be used. Insulin will also increase the storage of glucose through the um, production of glycogen and it will inhibit the release or anything that will increase blood sugar. Its regulation is going to be direct blood levels of nutrients in the blood affecting the pancreas. Also neural regulation, the um, after eating a large meal, when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, it will increase the release of insulin. And hormonal. Insulin can be affected um, by other hormones. It can be increased by glucagon, epinephrine, thyroxin, thyroid hormone related, and glucocorticoids, cortisol. It can be decreased by somatostatin. So this is the pancreas, and in particular, um, these are the cells in the pancreas located within these little islets of Langerhorn that produce insulin. So there's only about 1% of the pancreatic cells that produce insulin, um, or glucagon, or somatostatin. That's only 1% of the cells are actually hormone-producing cells. The rest of the pancreas is digestion-related. So the effects of insulin are huge. Insulin increases during the absorptive or post-digestive states. So you have a huge meal, high nutrient intake, and it facilitates the use of those nutrients. So you just took in a big meal and your body's going to say, yes, we just got a ton of food. Let's use that food while we've got it and store it in case we don't get food again for a while. So the targets of insulin um, are going to be the liver. So it's going to increase production and storage of glycogen in the liver. And general body cells, where it will increase glucose transport into the body cells. It'll also inhibit glycogen breakdown and gluconeogenesis in the liver. All three of those functions are going to lower blood sugar. And it will also lower fatty acids by storing fat. So it can um, increase the production of storage and storage of fats or triglycerides. It could increase the transport of fatty acids into fat tissue for the storage and production of triglycerides. And it can inhibit the breakdown of fats. It can also lower amino acids through the storage of protein. So it will increase the transport of amino acids into cells and it will inhibit protein breakdown. So one of the reasons we need to study insulin is because of the incidence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is a lack of insulin secretion from the pancreas, which can be treated with injected insulin. Type 2 diabetes is a lack of response to insulin. How do you get a lack of response to a hormone in a target cell? You got it. It's through the receptors. So a lack of response to the target cell is by having a lack of receptors or um, by having um, inactive receptors. Insulin treatment in this case will not help because if you don't have receptors in the target cell, you can throw as much insulin at them as you want, but it won't do anything. In that case, type 2 diabetes, where you have a lack of receptors, you can only treat type 2 diabetes with diet and exercise. High blood glucose due to lack of storage and use of glucose in body cells will be a result of diabetes or a result of a lack of insulin. So normally insulin lowers blood glucose. When you don't have insulin, you have extremely high blood glucose and that's why diabetics have to be very careful about what they eat and about testing their blood sugar levels. When you have high blood sugar, that's going to be difficult on your kidneys because your kidneys are going to have to work to balance your blood and eliminate all of that excess glucose in the urine. That can cause um, increased in urination, it can cause dehydration, loss of blood volume because you lose water when you're trying to eliminate excess from the kidneys. That can cause reduced blood flow to the brain and to other tissues. We also 
see polythagia or excessive hunger in patients with diabetes. So even though their blood sugar is super high, none of that sugar is getting into the cells. So the cells are, we say, starving amidst plenty. They have a ton of sugar around them, but they cannot grab onto it and bring it in. So they will be starving and they will have all of the symptoms and uh, further metabolic processes that happen during starvation. And that's excessive hunger, excessive food intake <coughs> due to the lack of nutrients. Okay, should we draw out the insulin pathway? Let's do it. Okay, so the endocrine gland here is the pancreas. The hormone is insulin. And insulin is going to travel through the bloodstream to body cells. Body cells will then have insulin receptors. And when they have insulin receptors, that will allow them to add glucose channels. When you add more glucose channels, you can get glucose into the cells. When you increase glucose into the cells, you decrease the glucose that's in the blood because the more glucose that leaves the blood to get into the target cells, the less glucose you have hanging out unused in your blood. It will also target the liver and the muscles to increase glycogen storage and decrease gluconeogenesis. All of these are related to keeping blood glucose levels down. It is stimulated by increased nutrients in the blood. It can also be stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system in a high or post eating state. And it can be stimulated by glucagon. Let me zoom in a little bit. Epinephrine. And related to thyroid hormones. cortisol, and somatostatin levels. Okay, so the job of insulin is to increase glucose use in the body cells and support the uptake of glucose in the body cells. If we don't have insulin, then we get increase in blood glucose that is seen in diabetes. If we don't have insulin receptors, we can also see an increase in blood glucose because there's no uptake in the cells that are lacking receptors. That is also diabetes. Lack of insulin is diabetes type one. Lack of insulin receptor is diabetes. So the next hormone is glucagon. Glucagon opposes insulin. It is active during states of fasting or low nutrient intake. So in between meals, basically. And glucagon's job is to increase blood glucose. It is a water-soluble hormone or amino acid-based. It is produced and released by the pancreas in the cells right nearby the insulin-producing cells and it is going to increase glucose synthesis 
glucose release and glycogen breakdown. Its regulation will be low levels of blood glucose, that's blood regulation, stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system, neural regulation, or hormonal. It's inhibited by insulin and somatostatin, which is a digestive related hormone. Glucagon is going to do the opposite of everything that insulin does. It will be increased in between meals during fasting states, and its job is to make sure there's enough blood sugar going to the brain. So it's going to increase blood glucose by acting on the liver to um, block glycogen storage and increase gluconeogenesis. It's going to also increase fatty acids and ketones by increasing fat breakdown and ketogenesis. It's going to decrease protein synthesis by inhibiting liver protein synthesis and increasing protein breakdown in the liver. It has no effect on muscle protein and no increase in blood amino acids. So overall, the control of blood glucose is really a balance between insulin and glucagon. Insulin is going to be active after eating in the fed state. Glucagon will be active in between meals or in the fasted state. When insulin is active, you have increased use or oxidation of glucose through cellular respiration, increased storage of glycogen, increased fat storage, and increased protein synthesis. When glucagon is dominant, you have increased glycogen breakdown, increased glucose production or gluconeogenesis, and increased ketone production. Overall, um, the balance of blood sugar depends on the balance between insulin, glucagon, and other hormones that affect blood sugar. Okay, I think that's enough for today. That was quite a lot of hormones and a lot of hormone pathways. Um, good luck getting everything organized. If you guys need any help or you have any questions, let me know.